is a natural. He was born an architect and he was born a curious architect. He has a real precision about what he wants to do. He is always looking for that clarity and intent. When you work with Patrick, you just have to pull back because Patrick's always right. Serious, but conservative, but uh, a great thinker. Well, I came across them as students, where even as students they were working as a team, even if they were competing, there was a team quality about the way they worked. All of their work was different, but it was always at such a high level. We ended up buying a big old villa in, in Parnell. So we had, I suppose, the basis of a personal relationship and, a, and a, to some extent one might call a business relationship via that. We finished university and headed off in different directions. Then we all got back together in England. Patrick and I, we both ended up working in an office in London together. And um, one very uh, raucous evening, actually in a villa in um, Tuscany, we decided uh, that we were all heading home and we might as well set this thing up. We decided we should form a practice, you know. Oh yeah, why not? We'll go back and form an architectural practice, no problem. I can remember we saying to Malcolm and when we started, I, I imagine this is like a 30-year project. Of course, now I realise it's probably a 40-year project. I think at the outset, when we were doing smaller scale work, we were a bit like a cooperative, I suppose, in that we all did the same things for the projects. Once we had the opportunity to do some larger work through some competition successes, we realised that in order to deliver those projects, we needed to acknowledge that we had differing and complementary skills we have striven to maintain a level of integrity with what we do and what we produce right through the process. Drawing is a way of remembering something. You don't just look at it, of course you draw it, therefore it becomes a part of the knowledge that, that you have about something. I also realised that drawing as a process wasn't just one of thinking it might be like this and drawing it, it was also uh, a process of drawing it and then thinking it might be like this. The drawing not only described something but it also suggested something and that manifests itself in terms of just sketching but also drawing more technically and I, I mean I know not, it's not so common now but I still like sitting with a little drawing board and actually drawing. Technically I still find that really helpful. We do rigorous work. I think to a large extent that has come from, uh, from Patrick's design leadership. Never been scared to revisit things and uh, iterations after iterations have been a feature of our design process. So I think we'd all be a lot richer if we'd, um, if we'd stuck to the first idea most of the time rather than um, coming up with a whole lot of others and then ending up back with the first one. We're constantly trying to review what we're doing and improve it as we go along. You think, oh gosh, we, we could have, we could just adjust that a little bit. <laughs> now, that's probably a habit that I have that is somewhat infuriating, but we do like to kind of carry on. We don't see the design ever coming to an end. There are a few drawers somewhere at the office now with, with, with drawings in it of schemes that didn't happen, um, two or three of them, before uh, the, the scheme that we developed and built. I didn't give him any kind of brief. I had absolutely no idea other than I liked what he did, I believed in what he did, and so I was quite happy to leave him to it. And it wasn't a process that I had a particular vision for at the beginning. Therefore, it took quite a long time. There's no one there to create the deadline, even though Leslie and I are, are doing this together. But th to be honest, there wasn't really an imperative that said, you know, you have to be finished. And that's a strength and a weakness, of course, so that it, it can become never ending. Um, but equally, it, it does allow time to actually investigate and work some things out that without that time wouldn't have happened. Patrick says to me, tell me what you want in one sentence and sort of eyeballs you and you think, 
I can't tell you what I want in one sentence, but it actually, you engage your thought process and you suddenly realise, well, actually, it's not that difficult. Two families, two living spaces that can be shared, but you're not all on top of one another. And that's exactly what my house is. No, I didn't say this is mandatory, but if we couldn't encapsulate the kind of idea of the building and the, and the way we wanted to do it in a sentence, then it's probably a bit complicated. In order to um, elaborate that simple sentence, we've just got the whole, yes, yeah, sort of the architectural language. She said to me, look, you don't do houses with roofs, and we, want a, we really want a house with a roof. So we gave this some thought, and we made a house with a very big gable folded roof that sits on top of then a series of blockwork elements. So we tried to take Kate's commentary and in our own way uh, make something that we thought uh, responded to that. He just got it. He somehow got it. My husband's six foot six and a half and my son is as well and my daughters are six foot. And you feel really small and petite in the environment. It's lovely. It's a lovely feeling. I have a real belief in that when you employ somebody like Patrick, that's what you're doing. You're employing somebody to do the job so don't interfere. I wouldn't want to challenge him on something that he felt very sure about. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't win. <laughs> Other architects said, how the f do you work with Patrick, you know? And uh, I say, well, you know, I really enjoy it because, you know, in many ways, you know, his strengths complement my weaknesses and my strengths complement his weaknesses. We work really well together and I enjoy being with him and I enjoy having a glass of wine with him. So that's the most important thing. The architects collaborate because they think it gives them, uh, I think on, on a really simple level, a better chance to get involved in the project. In terms of Jade Stadium, for example, we didn't think we would get that job. So when it was discussed and Ath suggested it initially, we thought, of, well, of course, why not? We don't think we can, we can do this project alone. And we knew that it would be an enjoyable thing just to get to know um, Affield Architects in a different way, even in putting the submission together. Once we got into it, we realised that we enjoyed the, the professional relationship and very much the social uh, relationship that went with that. We get together at meetings and we don't really have to say terribly much. Um, we seem to be able to support each other without actually having to get into a, an argument or even a, a long discussion because we sort of know uh, each other's uh, peculiarities or differences. I mean, I've got a better sense of humour than Patrick. That's one thing I, I know. Jade Stadium, I suppose, is a, you could think of it as a piece of infrastructure. Ath and I then, we looked at the project and thought there were two streets to the north and south of the site, the stadium site, and we thought one of the things this project could do was join those two streets together so people could enter from either end, meet and then disperse into the seating bowl. So we could make an inc what we thought was a very grand arrival up this ramp and then come uh, underneath the undercroft of this great um, sort of concrete construction. And also we thought though, like if you think about the initial structures that one might refer to, like the Colosseum, what, what is it about this? Is, is they're very heavy and muscular and structural and you're very aware of the weight and the loads and it's part of the excitement of them as being underneath um, these volumes. So we tried to make something that was like that. You have to know the relationship between how the buildings work internally and how they work as a whole campus. So I, I, I do think there's a certain uh, culture you have to understand about a school, and Patrick gets it. The technology building at St Peter's, I suppose, a project that had opportunity at quite a number of different levels. Interesting programmatically, really interesting location. Somewhere in amongst that, some thought, oh, if there was a vertical, there would be a cross. And, and I suppose it's a sort of somewhere in that drawing process, there's this relationship that emerges. And it was completely coincidental that the cross is actually asymmetrical and, and St. Peter was crucified upside down. So there was this uncanny relationship.
he actually gave us a bit of an identity. So people know the building. They know St Peter's now by the upside down cross. It's not aggressive work, nor is it passive, but it's work that has a, a presence and represents a series of ideas. All their jobs belong in the places to which they have been put. They all fit very well in their local surroundings and none of them are aggressive. And that's a, that's a really hard thing to achieve. How do you make positive architecture without making bold statements? Probably in the 90s when there was lots being written, um, you know, various articles about whether this or that project had the wow factor. And he turned to me once and he said, you know, at Architectus we don't do well. They did beautiful things, but not necessarily glossy or in your face or um, shiny. It's meaningful. It's a profession that offers you an opportunity every time. New projects, new beginning, new opportunity. You, you can approach this with a, with a kind of optimism that I think is, is, is very motivating. It's incredibly invigorating and, and rewarding to go and visit and be part of the process of the projects being built. You know, then people occupying them and enjoying them and, and, and responding to them. In between, there's quite a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. Well, he's the most consummate uh, sort of architect that I, I, I know. He's extremely consistent and he's a conductor of that office. He conducts that office, you know, and, uh, and does it very, very well. I think we will see that they will be one of the more significant architects of this generation of probably 40 years of architecture they will rise to the top and not because of perceived achievements because they will be leading the change of quality of architecture and that's the, the leading is entirely different from following and adapting because when they lead they have to be right and they generally are